Good morning and welcome to CEO Chat. My name is Al Sini. I'm Joe Asamendi. Yeah. Nice to see you, Al. Well, boy, what a great guest we have today. Yep. John Iona, who is the president of iConcilium and is involved with a whole bunch of companies. And if you look at his LinkedIn profile, it'll say right up front, he's a serial CEO, meaning he's committed the crime of being a CEO more than once. And uh, I can't think of a better, uh, better guest for the people who watch our program than John Iona. And, and I want to start with a conversation we kind of had yesterday. And that is that you know how to bridge the gap between a great idea, which lots of people have, and a successful business, which hardly anybody has. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and it's uh, really nice to be here. Thanks for having oh, me. What a pleasure. Very nice Thank to you. meet you. Thank you. Nice great. to meet you. So there's a lot of great ideas out there. Mm -hmm. You know, people generate them at the kitchen table. People uh, uh, generate them by uh, uh, instances in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how Virgin Airlines was created. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Having a bad experience with an airline uh, spawned that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's a huge gap between creating that idea and making it a company. Mm. And oftentimes uh, there are business plan competitions that uh, will uh, uh, spawn some terrific ideas, uh, some that are already brewing with mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, and some that are just uh, uh, sought uh, to be part of this thinking they can become entrepreneurs. Mm. And you and I had talked before. Mm. Uh, it's an intellectual argument I have with many professors in academia, yeah. including business deans, mm -hmm. that I believe you can't create an entrepreneur. You can teach people entrepreneurial skills. Mm -hmm. However, you can't teach the kind of people I've worked with across three decades to eat bologna sandwiches for two years and work out of the back of their car or triple mortgage their home, mm. or have that kind of fire in their belly that really makes them successful at the end of the day. Wow, mm -hmm. and you, you know what, I think you've got your finger on maybe one of the biggest blind spots in, uh, in, human, in, in human nature. That is, you've got a great idea and it's in your head, and the blind spot is you think it automatically jumps into other people's heads too, and they automatically jump on board with it, and you forget that there's some work you have to do between, between those two moments, there and sure that's where is. you come in. There sure is, and uh, by example, there was a business plan competition in northeastern Pennsylvania. It was in its 13th year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it had become uh, somewhat irrelevant. And the folks who run the plan came to me, and they said, would you be interested in getting involved and, and chairing it and reinvigorating it? And I looked at the structure of the competition. It involved 12 different colleges, from Penn State to University of Scranton to Wilkes College to uh, uh, some other uh, reg uh, regional and, and state colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they had done is charged these different schools that were involved with creating a business plan and presenting that business plan to a panel of judges who, unfortunately, in the past weren't really qualified to mm -hmm. evaluate an emerging growth business plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, having seen that, I said, okay, the first thing we're going to do is is uh, take the business plans and throw them out the window. Uh, okay. An old friend, uh, Pete Musser, uh, who started Safeguard Scientific and, mm. and also was involved with ICG, Internet Capital, and, and uh, a wide array of successful companies, had always said that the minute you hit print, that business plan is antiquated. It's irrelevant. <laughs> it's uh, like a military plan. As soon as you hit the beach, right. Absolutely. you're off the plan. Absolutely. <laughs> So what we did was we created uh, th uh, four deliverables, okay. okay? You had to have that killer two-page executive summary, mm -hmm. uh, 12 to 14-page pitch deck mm -hmm. that was very compelling, a lot of white, but a lot of, a lot of talk behind it, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, pro forma of three to five years, financial pro forma, mm -hmm. okay? And the most competitive, uh, the most important thing was the competitive analysis. Mm. Because when you think about it, if you're looking for my money, and I'm looking to raise uh, $2 million. And if you don't know everything about your competitors, I'm not going to give you a red cent. Right. Not only do you have to know that your competitors and every one of them eat cornflakes in the morning, mm. you've got to know what fruit they put on it. Seriously. And I'm not just talking right. about strawberries or bananas. You have to know. Yeah. And that deep dive is what entrepreneurs typically 
forget? Uh, well, they, they often forget it because mm -hmm. they think they could put a matrix together and, yeah. and that tells the story. They have to take a deep dive. Well, that's important. Mm -hmm. It's and very important. If you're gonna play defense, you gotta get so close to the offensive player, you can tell what flavor gum they're chewing. That's, that's exactly yeah, right. That's, that's exactly right. Guy, but that's exactly right. I mean, that's really it. So, you, you know, I think that's so valuable. And we, we talked about how this 30 minute program could be a condensed kind of an MBA <laughs> for a lot of people. It's not about how wide the margins are or what font you use, which a right. lot of people get spun up on. It's the who's going to buy your stuff, how much you're going to make, right. mm -hmm. how are you going to spend that money over the next three years, and right. who are you going to have to kill, basically, to win that business. Right. <laughs> and, you know, your competition ranges from the 800-pound gorilla out there who's mm -hmm. got deep, deep traction and mm -hmm. brand uh, equity mm -hmm. to the startups that you don't see, and that's the hard part the hardest part of doing that competitive analysis. Really? Mm -hmm. And again, that's the most important thing. Anybody could make a spreadsheet do backflips. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of finance majors, they can make Excel, you know, do magical things. Mm -hmm. And unless and until you've got a story behind that. Right, right. And you're addressing that competition along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and even if you don't have IP, okay, if you've got a first mover advantage, you, you are, after all your uh, due diligence, you find you are unique. Mm -hmm. Remember, the second mouse often gets the cheese. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, if, you're gonna, if you've got to speed the market play, you've got to hit it hard and you've got to hit it fast. I have a question for you. When it, an, an idea is, it could be great, but isn't it a management team is just as important, if not more important? No doubt, no doubt. I can probably 90% or more of the investors I know will take a great management team and a good product Mm -hmm. over a great product and a good management team any day. Wow. Oh, any good. day. Right. Yeah, so a great idea can be mismanaged and ruined. I've, I've seen some of the most promising technologies that are now on the shelf or crashed and burned mm -hmm. that in some cases were actually lifesavers that, that came out of uh, uh, university think tanks wow. Wow. Uh, that are shelved because of mismanagement or people doing wrong uh, things with uh, trials right. or running out of money and not f looking for funding when they didn't need it. See, right. that's a trick too. Mm -hmm. Never ask for money when you need it, okay? Because you're begging, you're not negotiating. You're begging and they'll know and that's... Uh... And a lot of these entrepreneurs uh, think it's important to get the highest valuation on their term sheets, mm. okay? When they miss all the all the language in between that right. talks about provisions right. such as, uh, you know, preferences, uh, liquidation preferences, such as uh, double uh, ratchet provisions that could be very onerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So don't just look at that number. You've got to read, and that's why you need a good lawyer. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. We're, we're going to have to take a break. I mean, this is a great program. Absolutely. As usual, you ask the best question. <laughs> <laughs> it's always Joe. Uh, we'll be right back with more CEO Chat and John Iona after yes. these messages. Don't Thank go you. away. Welcome back to CEO Chat. Uh, you're Joe Asiman. And you're El Cini. And and it's CEO always a Chat. pleasure to bump into you Absolutely. here at, uh, on a Friday morning. And, mm -hmm. and our guest, uh, we're coming back and talking to uh, John Iona, who is the CEO and founder of iConcilium. We'll mm -hmm. talk about that and your other companies a little later. But during the break, and as you were answering Joe's question from the last segment, I was thinking uh, entrepreneurs, guys with ideas, people with ideas, uh, have a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. And you were saying that's the minimum. I mean, they need to have that. Absolutely. Yeah, That's a starting point. There, but if they stop there. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't demonstrate you're turned on and excited mm -hmm. and that you've got something unique and something valuable and, and prove that the market's got a, a major pain point, you're not going to get anybody's attention. Really? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The first thing is, Certainly. in your pitch, you have to be able to say why this is important to you. And you've got to communicate that importance with energy and enthusiasm. Right. There's emotion in building a business. It's Absolutely. not all just crossing T's and dotting I's. No, it's personal. But if, but if you go on after that and cross the uh, I's and dot the T's, or don't bother doing any of that, that's where you come in. Well, uh, I come in uh, at various times, mm -hmm. okay? I've taken over for founders on many occasions whereby, whether it be a scientist, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, some inventor, mm -hmm. somebody who is a leading thinker, who comes up with a phenomenal uh, idea for a business or a product or has some kind of IP or first mover advantage and hits the ground running and gets some early investors. Uh, you know, you start with the friends and family and then you get some angels and then mm -hmm. perhaps angel groups or super angels will go up to a million or more. Mm -hmm. 
And if they're getting into that Series A, that first uh, real professional round, uh, oftentimes investors will say, we love the business, you're plateaued, uh, we will invest in you, however, you need a professional CEO. You need a professional CEO. And I've walked into various situations where companies are in distress to companies who actually have their stuff together, but the founder is at a point where he or she doesn't enjoy watching that lockbox to make sure that they're going to make payroll next right, week right, right. or going out in front of clients because they may be introverted a bit and mm -hmm. they're not, they don't have a solid background in sales and marketing or finance. Mm -hmm. So I've got to have, uh, I've got to be a jack of all trades oftentimes when I go in. And the thing is when, when these founders are told uh, or that discussion ensues with investors that we have to bring in a professional CEO, mm -hmm. intellectually, they understand it right away. Mm -hmm. Emotionally is right. right. often a right. lag. Exactly. And right. particularly if that founder had a liquidity event after those two years of baloney sandwiches right. mm -hmm. uh, in which he took a million or two off the table, uh, she may be uh, a bit of a challenge to manage. Now you're managing millionaires right. in a company that's virtually sure. a startup right. Right. and essentially uh, at times attacking uh, his or her baby, yeah. which is a very sensitive thing. Well, it's, it's, I'm so glad you brought us down that road because uh, an idea is, like, a company really is like a child and you have a founder out there who's created this company. Maybe they ran it for a while, maybe they built it to a point where now they have somebody managing it for them. But maybe that manager, maybe a CEO, is having a little bit of difficulty getting it to the next level that they expected when they turn their company over to that management team. Yes. On that basis, you're a turnaround CEO. You can come into a company like that and begin to fix the the problem, isn't that right? Yeah, and there are, it doesn't always have to be a problem. Mm -hmm. It could just be at that stage where the company is plateaued mm -hmm. and they may need a different go-to-market strategy. They may need a different, uh, 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 what I call a penetrate and radiate. They may have a central offering, mm -hmm. but there are other ways to infiltrate your, your client organizations with mm -hmm. secondary offerings yeah. or complementary products. Right. So that's what I see, and I'm a big believer in what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. A lot of these early stage companies will just run and run hard, yeah. and before they know it, they've got a million or two in revenue. Right. And mm -hmm. now the professionals, okay, your board is going to come, uh, and it's gonna be made up of your investors primarily. Mm -hmm. And every quarter, they're gonna beat down the founder, and, and I'm not saying you're all uh, bad people, mm -hmm. but they'll beat down the founder and uh, for the numbers, oh, really? okay? And uh, that's what they're interested in. And oftentimes, there isn't a coaching group. Mm. That, uh, and, and one of my friends uh, did it right. Uh, I won't mention his name. Mm. He asked me to put together an advisory board mm -hmm. uh, for him alongside his professional investors, mm -hmm. and these were all uh, big names within the vertical they served. Mm -hmm. And we would meet separate and apart, and we would essentially coach and open up our Rolodex that shows my age mm -hmm. uh, for these mm -hmm. young uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, fast forward several years, uh, I'm actually on the beach and with my family mm -hmm. in uh, Positano, Italy. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I get a phone call that uh, they just got taken out uh, for nine figures. Wow. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and I think we had a lot to do with helping develop uh, that young management team whereby the investors were just interested in that top line growth. Do you find it different to work with a family um, business and regular that's a business? Great question. That's, that's, a great question. that's interesting because there's something called the Family Business Alliance up in okay. Wilkes-Barre and Scranton. Uh -huh. And they invite me to be the outsider who has run family businesses, mm. but not as a family that member. A family member, right. And that's a challenge. I've done that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's, 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 you walk a very uh, thin line. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are indeed the CEO, you're going to make some tough decisions now and again. Right. And everything, or nearly everything, becomes emotional in a family business. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a small family business. Right. I've also run a, 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 a pretty large uh, arm of Day and Zimmerman, mm -hmm. which is a very large family business, uh, mm -hmm. uh, several billion a year, mm -hmm. and that was quite different. Right. Uh, so you didn't run into those kinds of things. Yeah, there was sure. a structure, it was very professional. Well, more mature et and uh, more, um, more distributed so that it's not just the family, there are other members of the team too. And mm -hmm. In a situation like that, you need to be honest, but you can't be brutally honest. No, uh, there's a emotional intelligence that's required, uh, it really is. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, you manage everybody differently. Mm. And I mean that 
not in the sense of fairness and uh, not being fair, mm -hmm. but everybody's got their own unique needs. I, right. I inherited a salesman once who actually was uh, married to a billionaire. Mm -hmm. And uh, he certainly, uh, you know, didn't have that fire in his belly. Right. At least I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I approached him and I said, listen, um, I got to see a little more spark. Uh, you know, you're charged with being vice president of sales. Uh, we need uh, this, we need that. Why don't you get out there and, you know, hit it hard. Right. And uh, long story short, he told me that uh, it was very important for him to be successful because his father-in-law, uh, you know, wanted to uh, have a son who was a son-in-law that was successful. Kind of and for him. It, indeed. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, "Well, having said that, I'll help you be a superstar." Well, see, and yeah, which means it doesn't have to be about punishment; it could be about reward and partnership. And uh, indeed, just you know, understanding you know, we need, we need him. To take a break. Uh, that is such an important part of your value proposition, John. I mean, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, you're a turnaround CEO who knows how to get to what needs to be done in order to make a difference in a company, but you also know that there are people in this company and those people need to be treated with respect and a certain amount of compassion, or it's not just about being brutally honest about the facts, you've got to respect the people too. And Absolutely. when we come back in a few minutes, I want to talk, we're definitely going to want to talk to you about your companies, Iconcilium and the other companies. Mm -hmm. and We'll be back with more CEO chat when in about how long? About a minute? About a minute, minute and a half. Okay, good, minute, minute and a half. We'll be Don't back with more John Iota. Don't go anywhere. We'll Absolutely. be right back. Thank you. Welcome back to CEO Chat. This is such a great program. Yes, it uh, is. This and particular we'll... installment is a great one. I'm yeah, Alcini. I'm Joe Asimendi. And, and this guy is John Iona, right. who is the CEO of Iconcilium, and he'll mm -hmm. be telling us about that in a little bit. But during the break and at the end of the last segment to keep this conversation going, you talked about the importance of employee engagement, and that really speaks to our heart. We're in the brand and culture alignment business. Sure. And, uh, and you've got this story about uh, making sure the people care as much about the company mm -hmm. as their customers might. I, why don't you go ahead and tell that? And they've got to. And I, I'm a big believer that owners behave differently. I was involved with a company in the early 90s that did a reverse merger before mm -hmm. anybody knew what a reverse merger was. We mm -hmm. took a clean shell at 75 cents a share, mm -hmm. drove the stock to $18, mm -hmm. dollars, and, and, and a handful of people rang the bell. But the mm -hmm. vast majority of people involved with getting us there didn't. Mm -hmm. The stock went down to six. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, uh, so it goes. So I had an opportunity to the opportunity to do my first turnaround. Mm -hmm. the company was doing about 10 million a year, losing two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I was offered this job by the board of directors, and I said, well, I'd like something called the president's pool, because all my senior executives had stock plans, mm -hmm. and I know owners behave differently. Right. So they gave me 100,000 uh, uh, deeply discounted options mm -hmm. to be able to give out on a spot basis. So if somebody did something really special for the company in February, they didn't have to worry about their boss remembering in December. Right. Okay, right it was real time. And within the first year, uh, we had about 80 people in the headquarters. There were, most of our people were out in the field around the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, within the first year, everybody had shares. And whether it was uh, 7 o'clock in the morning or 7 p.m. at night, you didn't just see BMWs in the parking lot. You saw everyone from the clerks right up mm. to the executives. They were, they were all there, and they wanted to do it, and they wanted to be, they wanted to be owners, and this was right. their opportunity to be an owner of the company. And as we said before, in a bacon and eggs breakfast, right. the chicken's only interested, but mm -hmm. the pig's committed. Right. Right. And to that philosophy, I wanted everybody to be pigs, and we sure. were pigs in that, in that uh, positive sense. So I had this cast iron pig bell, <laughs> that whenever somebody got the call from a client that we got a contract, and our contracts range from right. about 500000 to as much as $10 million. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that uh, gentleman who was the vice president of sales walked in and rang the bell once for about $8 million. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I sent, I sent he and his wife right to the Four Seasons, to the Fountain Room, uh -huh. mm -hmm. get a suite. He goes, but it's Tuesday night. I said, yeah, tomorrow you come to work. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You celebrate yeah, now. It, so. and, uh, and we... And so check out at 6, because you've got to be at work right now. That, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, that gave him a little leeway. He'd come <laughs> in at noon that day. Oh, right. well, but uh, be that as it may, whenever somebody got that call, they'd come up to my office and ring the bell. Every would gather around, and mm -hmm. we'd celebrate uh, the origin of the opportunity, the proposal, wow. team, right. everything. And then we'd all, if it were a minute after noon, We'd run out to the Great American Pub and we'd celebrate and make, make a party out of it. And, and this was a recognition of exceptional performance. And you did that not just for the VP, but all the way down to the people who answered the phone. Everyone. And about 20 years, this was about 20 years ago. And they, again, they're a several hundred million dollar company to this wow. day. That's and terrific. several people are uh, 
millionaires as a result of the stock they accumulated. And, and they um, deserved it. They earned it. it. And they're not losing money anymore, which no. is great. So, no, I mean, they're, it's making, a, they're doing it's, well. It's a testimony to the fact that engaged employees right. make the pie yeah. bigger. It's not about making the Absolutely. slices smaller. It's about making the pie bigger. And, and culture is your business, right. and you know that better than that anyone. Is, uh, well, it's just so important. I have another question for you. Uh, maybe... Uh, you have a great idea for a business, but you might have the wrong business model. Do you address that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's what happened with that company. Mm. Okay. Uh, for example, they were selling to the wrong people. Uh -huh. And it was a financial play, uh, cost of capital kind of thing, and they were explaining it to the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And when these people brought it to their supervisors and on up the ladder, and we're talking about millions of dollars here, mm -hmm. they ran out of intellectual gas to explain the value prop. So. I decided we're going to sell it to the CFO mm. because the CFO is a very lonely person usually. Nobody wants to, you know, bang on their door right. and salesmen typically aren't calling on them. Mm -hmm. And if they're not in the middle of a 10Q or a 10K, mm. their door is pretty open and, and they get it right away. They right. understood this model right away. I mm -hmm. presented McKinsey data, which is, is uh, you know, was tangible. Mm -hmm. They'd walk down the hall to the COO's office. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, from that point on, it just rolled. Wow. Yeah, wow. So that was changing the model by changing the target right. and explaining it to people who will understand the value prop. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Uh, now, we're coming up on that part of the program where you get to tell everybody how to reach you. But so take, a, take a little bit of time. Tell us about Iconcilium and what it does and some of your other companies. And then tell everybody. I'll let you know. You look in the camera and tell everybody how to reach you. Go ahead. Okay. Iconcilium. So Iconcilium is really a, a, a boutique consultancy where I advise boards and CEOs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's in between uh, the gigs I do as a hired gun CEO. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may be for a period of a couple of months. It may be for a period of a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I come in and I work with emerging growth companies, usually founders, sometimes their boards, investors, and help them navigate through uh, the tough parts of uh, startups. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that's, that, that's, that's the focus of my practice. Thank you. You do for people what you've done for them really on our program today, right. which is advise them on how to make the difference between a dreamy idea and, a, and an actual practical business. And I, and I introduce them to service providers. I've got uh, countless contacts in, in the legal community. Yes. Accountants, uh, marketing, uh, Marcom companies, et cetera. So I set them up with the right teams. And so mm -hmm. if they, by hiring you, your network becomes their network, and that's, uh, that's absolutely in itself. That's Indeed. Terrific. Indeed. Okay, great. Tell everybody how to reach you, John. Uh, go ahead and talk right into your camera. Okay, so I can be reached uh, online. Uh, my website is i concilium.com. I think it's up there on the screen. Mm -hmm. I could be reached, uh, I'll give you uh, one of a dozen email addresses. This is the easiest. It's john, J-O-H-N, at ptd.net, peterthomasdavid.net, john at ptd.net, and I'll even give you my phone number. My phone number is 610-764-9000, 610-764-9000. I'd be delighted to talk to you, whether you're an investor or you're a founder, or you're uh, turning around a company, or if there's anything I can help you with. Yeah, that's John. Thank you so much for being my here pleasure. To chat today. My pleasure. It's great pleasure. to be here. Pleasure, John. Thank you. Indeed. And, thank uh, you. you. You just heard from John Iona. He's a guy you need to call if you've mm -hmm. got any of the issues that we talked about today. And it is. I'm telling you, 15 minutes with John Iona is better than three years of Wharton. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> more profitable too. And more profitable too. And less expensive, but yes. <laughs> but it's a wonderful talking to you. Exactly. And, and and thank you all for joining us today on CEO Chat. We hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, I'm Al Cini. I'm still Joe Asamendi. And you guys have a great weekend. Great weekend. Be safe. We'll see you next week. Thanks.